Hello and welcome to this very special conversation at Kalaba Conversations. We've literally saved the best for the last. This is sort of the cherry on top. And we've called this conversation from Paris to Glasgow. It almost covers the historical arc of climate change as we've seen it from that Paris Climate Agreement in 2015 to the Glasgow conference that happened this year. What has become abundantly clear is that climate change and sustainable changes have to be made at a very organic level, from an individual to a community to a city. And one city that has really made large strides in that direction is our very own Mumbai here in Maharashtra. I am very glad to introduce uh, to you our next guest and the one who will be speaking to me, the Honorable Environment Minister for Maharashtra, Mr. Aditya Thakre. Thank you very much for taking out time, Mr. Thakre. Uh, so much to talk about in terms of climate change and sustainability, but let me start with an interesting initiative that you've just announced at the Maharashtra government, which is the Maji Vasundra initiative. And what's great about it is the way it links, uh, you know, what I was just talking about, an individual, a community, a corporate, and, a, and uh, the not-for-profits as well. Um, what is it that you saw, you know, that would really make this happen, and why are you excited about this campaign? Uh, firstly, thank you for hosting the session for us. Uh, we're really happy and proud to have this Kolaba conversation in Mumbai. And uh, we're looking forward to a physical presence of everyone next year onwards. We're looking forward to it, uh, to have a lot of people come to Mumbai, come to Maharashtra and see what it is about. Uh, going beyond that, this last session, of course, all the sessions have been really great. I would like to thank everyone who participated in that from the world over. Um, and like you said, uh, you know, you've called this session the cherry on the top of the cake. So <laughs> it's going to be good, hopefully. I think uh, what we've realized now is um, what we saw as erratic weather events in the past few years. Uh, they've actually been major symbols and signals of climate change. And therefore, on uh, Gandhi Jayanti last year, that 2nd October, we started with Maji Vasundra. It's a simple thing, actually. Um, normally, when we speak about climate change, it's the governments that are really ignorant to it or um, we're preaching the world about climate change, but not really looking inward. What we thought is when we start off with Maji Vasundra, it generally means my planet and how do we take care of it? So we've uh, divided this competition into five elements of nature and we've told all the government machinery, all our collectors, our divisional commissioners, our CEOs, um, our municipal commissioners, because both urban and rural areas will contribute to either climate change mitigation or adaptation or probably increase climate change, God forbid. So we've uh, divided it into five elements of nature and we've said whatever you can really do to contribute towards mitigation and adaptation of climate change is what we are going to judge you on. And the competition runs from 2nd October to um, the 5th of June. We're looking inward, we're looking at our own carbon footprint. So we're, we started off with our own uh, machinery. We said, let's see what our travel audit looks like. Does everyone have you know, mobility that is clean and green? Uh, do we travel short distances? Can we travel them on our bicycles? Or can we get electric mobility into our government systems? Can we walk from our homes to our offices? Or can we just you know, use one day in the week to not use our traditional cars, which emit uh, uh, you know, carbon? The other is, of course, uh, looking at our offices. Whether in our own offices, we have rainwater harvesting, rainwater percolation, because when we speak about cities, really, and when we speak about urbanization, we also have this whole concept of the concrete jungles. And because of these concrete jungles, the water that used to percolate into our aquifer or groundwater has reduced. So we're trying to make rainwater percolation pits so that the rainwater actually seeps down to the ground and recharges our groundwater tables or our wells. Uh, third, we're looking at whether our sources of energy for the whole building, are we really efficient on energy? Do we have LED lights or do we have um, you know, mechanisms to prevent the electricity from being wasted in rooms that are not occupied? Can we take solar energy onto our rooftops? These are some of the things we're looking at. Can we plant more trees? Do we have uh, better, better waste segregation uh, mechanisms within our offices? So I think we started off with that. The response now has been tremendous. So now we've actually weaved in, like you said, many, many, many more things into this. So we are getting in schools, we're getting in the police force, we're getting in corporates, we're getting in NGOs. We're working on this concept called co-governance rather than non-governmental organizations. We're saying, look, this is something which we all are going to face together. And if we have to face together, we've got to stand together and act together. And climate change is not something we're looking at. You know, very often it's said that this is the last decade that we have 10 years to repair the planet, 10 years to uh, heal the wounds. There are two things I primarily believe in. One is, we as human beings are nobody to repair or heal the world. 
nature repairs itself what we are doing is damaging the world we need to stop that damage and two we don't have 10 years if we don't act starting from today we're not going to act at all i'll give you a small example um the year 2020 we faced covid we faced a lot of um, problems in terms of the zoonotic disease but going beyond that what maharashtra has faced um, we faced two cyclones that we've never seen before in the last 10 years or more than that uh, we faced erratic weather events be it in the farms be it in the cities and the quantum of relief money that we we've, we've had to compensation that we have had to give to people or farmers or urban people is almost at the tune of 13 and a half thousand crores in a year now if that scale we can invest in climate change mitigation and action i think we'd be a better place altogether no i hear you and uh, indeed it's been a completely sort of crazy year climate wise congratulations as well on mumbai being added to the c40 list and like you said mr thank Kandri, you thing that it happens in the context of a post covid world where you know all these threats are more real and they are more intense as well you know tell me for yourself as environment minister what c40 changes for you in terms of your focal lens going ahead for the city and what you want it to be so i was reading actually this uh, book by uh, mr pope and mike bloomberg and uh, it's called uh, the climate of hope and of course i was just going through it you know and the different types of uh, initiatives that cities world over have taken uh, to fight fight climate change and here in mumbai itself we've we've declared the ra forest a patch of 808 acres almost 329 hectares within our city limits as a reserve forest i don't think any other city in the world has done that uh, way back in 2013 one of the things i was really pushing was electric mobility back then we got about six electric buses today we have a fleet of almost 380 electric buses we're going to take it up to 25% of our uh, total fleet in the next 2 or 3 years uh, we're planting urban forests so in a city nearby to us thane we've got one uh, urban forest of almost 9 acres with miyawaki plantation intensely planted and now a city like mumbai or a city like thane or pune or latur or um, nagpur we are doing urban plantations with the miyawaki plantation method so we're doing intensive urban plantations that are giving us thickets in the middle of the city so the, uh, in mumbai itself we are going to plant about 300000 trees and we've gone more, more than 90% of our target for the year 2020 i think these are some of the things that we really focused on and what i genuinely believe is um, when we speak about again climate change or environment or uh, doing anything to repair the world or do a bit for this healing uh, it's the urban centers that really matter more it's the cities around the world that really matter more because we speak about quality of life we speak about urbanization we speak about uh, a whole culture of development and of course uh, you know use and throw and that is i think where the problem really lies because we forget that in quality of life environment plays a major major part not just concrete uh, we forget that in development there is a word or a prefix called sustainable not just development without sustainable uh, you know that is where the problem lies when we speak about the use and throw culture we forget about segregating a waste before we throw so when we speak about climate change and mitigation uh, climate change and adaptation we need to have cities at the forefront of this fight we need to have cities like new york london paris uh, la mumbai moscow san francisco sydney at the forefront but also hand holding our junior cities or smaller towns from the neighborhoods i think this culture that really uh, would seep into the cities when we speak about urbanization the good parts about urbanization can you know spread across the world because more and more world more and more smaller towns and villages are uh, facing urbanization as a pattern so the cities will lead and therefore i thought it was you know imperative that mumbai becomes a part of c40 uh, a the amount of work we're doing on climate change action and mitigation b the amount of um, deliberations the amount of negotiations the amount of discussions we can have with our fellow cities around the world and implement the best of it all into our city the potential was tremendous and the fact that a city like mumbai is taking this on on multiple fronts i mean it's not just where the changes but also sea level rises so there's a lot on your plate as environment minister uh, i want to unpack some of what you just talked about especially with regards to what happened in ra i still remember the two word tweet that you put out ra saved exclamation yes. mark uh 
you know, and, and that was important, not just because, as you said, for creating forest and thicket area, but the kind of heat island effect that was happening in a city like Mumbai. Tell me why Are was so emotional and so close to you and why uh, it has had a salutary effect, especially in terms of lowering temperatures, etc., in a, a closed uh, area like Mumbai. So Are traditionally was a milk colony, actually. And a lot of uh, these milk colonies were settled there so that we could have our milk supply to the city from that area. But if you actually travel around that area, really, um, you have the Sanjay Gandhi National Park, you have Vyur on the other side, and uh, you have a tiger safari, a lion safari, and you have a huge buffer zone where biodiversity actually exists. And when I speak about biodiversity, uh, I don't just mean the larger one. Of course, you have the leopards roaming around there. You have this uh, beautiful leopard is called the Luna. And uh, Luna has her nine cubs roaming around. Uh, going beyond that, you have the rusty spotted cat. You have a lot of lesser species like spiders. And you've got a lot of endemic creatures to Are as well. You've got a lot of flora fauna. And if you go there, you'll be fully convinced that it is a forest. Um, in the past few years, slowly, slowly, especially the last two or three decades, we've seen this whole urban sprawl move into RA and then the man-animal conflict happens, human-animal conflict happens there where uh, we believe that the leopard is coming into our homes. We're actually going into its home. So, uh, you know, and then we've got rulings, judgments, we've got uh, government orders where development was allowed into that area. What I thought essentially was to declare this as a forest and thankfully because of the chief minister, Mr. Uddhav Thakre, uh, the DCM, Mr. Jeet Pawar ji, then you've got, you know, the whole team, uh, RA Minister, uh, Mr. Sunil Kedar, and the Forest Minister, Mr. Sanjay Rathodji, all of them put together, you know, I was uh, just trying to make the ends meet out there, uh, trying to coordinate stuff, but all of them came together and declared this area of 329 hectares in a city like Mumbai as a forest. Now, if you've lived in a city like Mumbai or been to the city of Mumbai, uh, you will see what a bustling metropolis it is. It's probably one of the busiest cities in the world, one of the densest cities in the world. Uh, and in that, we are an island city. We've got seven islands linking up. So we don't have an area which we can just, you know, go in a circular motion outwards. So for us, what is really crucial is to have urban thickets in our city like Are. And Are, like I said, it's got a bustling wildlife habitat. So it was very, very crucial for us to prevent the so-called development of human needs and human creeds to get into Are and protect Are because finally we need to protect these areas. I had said this um, way back in 2017, 2016, when we were fighting for RA. And like you said, you know, when I tweeted RA saved, it was the opposite of save RA, which was still that date when till the minister, till the chief minister signed it. Uh, and we said save RA because back then I had said that today we have Wi-Fi hotspots in the city and we connect to it. A few years later, when we end up cutting all the forests like that, uh, that lie around us, we'll have oxygen hotspots. Now, unfortunately, because of COVID, we've started having that, but we don't want to cut down our forests and have oxygen hotspots everywhere. Uh, if you look at our city again, traditionally we've had two weather stations, one in Kulaba, one in Santa Cruz. And uh, it's always been that the Santa Cruz weather station always recorded a slightly lesser uh, temperature than Kulaba. Today, both have almost come to the same area because Kulaba was always a sprawling urban sprawl and uh, Santa Cruz was the green area. Today, more or less, both the stations have a huge urban sprawl and population density around it. Um, we need green areas in our city. There was a survey recently uh, that was published in the newspapers as well, where we had a couple of heat maps of the city. And wherever we have a good area of green cover, the heat was much lesser than informal housing, be it something like slums because of uh, the, uh, the steel or asbestos sheets or the plastic sheets that cover it. So we also need to look at formal informal housing and we need to look at green cover like RA within our city. Yeah, that's the World Resource Institute uh, data you're talking about. Um, exactly. Uh, in fact, I was interested to read as well recently, I think the the, the swamp area in the Dodamar Taluka has also been declared a biodiversity site. So, you know, it, it's heartening to hear that this is spreading out. The other thing that you raised, Mr. Thakre, was about electric vehicles. And I know that that's something you are moving forth with, uh, you know, with quite a bit of alacrity. Why do you think that is important for a commercial city like Mumbai? And do you see that tying in with goals of net car? neutrality it is it is uh, very crucial for us as the world to move towards that because when we look at emissions of course uh, that is a major source of emissions and we'll be going towards cleaner fuel but yet it's not enough to look at what we're doing with that when we compare it to um, the global environmental crisis that we're facing today and 
I've been a strong believer of uh, electric mobility way back since about 2012, 2013, when I first came across it. We got electric buses back then, and that was a time of, you know, eight hours of charging and 120 kilometers of one run. Today, we've got fast charging and about 300 kilometers of one run. So I think it's rapidly improving. We've got a huge scope, and I foresee that in the next two or three years, uh, the world would see a lot more electric cars around the world and uh, on the streets, especially a state like Maharashtra, where we have cities like Mumbai, Thane, uh, Nagpur, Kolhapur, Sambhaji Nagar, Latur, all of these cities really can have a lot of electric cars um, all over. But what I strongly believe also is when we are looking at developing electric mobility or um, alternative fuel like biogas or hydrogen cell fuel, but when we speak about electric mobility, we need to have a cleaner ecosystem of electric mobility. We can't be burning coal on one side and fueling electric cars. We need to have an ecosystem of uh, wind energy or offshore wind, or we can have solar energy. So one of the things that we've actually pursued uh, MSRDC and uh, got done is we've solarized our highways. So the Mumbai Nagpur Samruti Highway uh, would have a generation capacity of 230 megawatts of solar energy. Um, we're also trying to have floating solar panels on our lakes and dams across the state. So we're doing these experiments so that we can really have clean energy needs met by 2025. That's really important. And I think uh, of most cities in India, the average Mumbai curry is so responsible about public transport. So salutations to everyone in Mumbai as well who really practices that and just doesn't just preach it. You know, the other thing that has sort of put Mumbai on the climate map is uh, the Mithi River project, of course, but also the intensity of the beach cleanups. And I must mention you within that because you've been there pre-COVID, especially right there in the middle, in the mix of everything. Uh, this one was... I, I think uh, personally important for you, wasn't it? Uh, the Mithi River, of course, because of its you know, sewage consequences, but the beach cleanup as well. Both of it, because I live by the Mithi and uh, if it overflows, it's going to come into my home. And for <laughs> most of Mumbai cars, you know, it's a very, very crucial issue. But uh, even the beaches, you know, I go there with Afros, I go there with Chinu, with Malar, all these, uh, you know, uh, guys, fabulous guys working on the beaches and Afros, Afros has become environmental hero but what he does or whatever i do we just go there out there for uh, you know relaxation and uh, while cleaning we actually cleanse our own minds and our systems we just feel so calm while uh, at the beach cleanup because you're just enjoying the wind you're looking at a cleaner side it's almost like you know when you tidy a room and you feel good about it that you've achieved something it's that feeling so uh, yes the beach cleanups we're also working on the mithi river that is going on very well there are three other rivers that we're working on within the city of Mumbai. That's Thaisar, Oshivar, and Poisar. We're looking at clean Anala's. And overall, we're also looking at uh, the rivers across Maharashtra. So the Nag Nadi in uh, Nagpur, we're looking at the Panchaganga in Kolhapur. We're looking at the Mula Mutha River in uh, Pune. What we're really working on at a policy level is a marine litter policy. Because when we speak about um, water, when we speak about rivers, when we speak about cleaner oceans, we need to start at our own taps. Um, you know, that's where we're starting off with. And if we can have a marine litter policy in place, I think we'd have achieved a lot because we're actually taking out this policy to reach out to the citizens and have a better, more responsible usage of water. For example, one of the big steps Mumbai is taking today is we're making about eight sewage treatment plants. As of today, we throw almost 3,200 million liters of water per day untreated into the ocean. With the STPs up in the next six years, we'd have almost... 2,800 million liters a day, uh, recycled, cleaned, and back into Mumbai's usage. So that way we have more water for Mumbai and cleaner water um, for usage rather than just being thrown into the sea. So yes, that's quite a lot uh, on our plate in terms of uh, the marine policy, but it's fun to do all this. I think it, it, it's good when you see the results and when you know that this is for the next 50, 100 years. Absolutely. And you're the one who, uh, you know, provided a froze the support when he needed it when he was beginning to flag and it's great that he kept the momentum going from there. Uh, two part question to you on financing, you know, because as you mentioned, there is an incredible cost involved with this. What do you think is the, the better way to do it going ahead? Should there be more incentives given to green tech? Should it become easier in terms of raising green financing? That's one part of it. And the second that's interesting in terms of what Mumbai is doing 
is providing tax incentives on waste segregation. Um, th that's another really interesting way to go about it, where A, you're looking at sourcing finance, but B, you're also looking at some kind of financial reward for making uh, you know, responsible choices about your environment. That is true. Uh, what we did is within the development rules of the city, we've actually uh, excused from the FSI the composting pits that every housing society or every building or every home can make within its compound. Um, and this is a story of great hope because when we started off in 2017, almost 10,000 metric tons of garbage every single day was generated by the city of Mumbai. Um, we started off with requesting every citizen that please segregate your waste. Uh, you know, you need to segregate waste before it comes out to the streets because it is really, really important that we have our dumping yards close in the next few years. With the bulk generators, like more than 100 kgs, we said we won't pick up your garbage till you segregate it. Trust me, within that year, we reduced our waste generation and collection from 10,000 metric tons a day to almost about 6,500 metric tons a day. Um, I think that gives us great hope. And this was almost only about 25 to 30% of the people doing it. So now as we move further, um, with more and more awareness coming in children, in kids, in students, the youth, and then of course, spreading it to all generations. I think that is something where we look at with great hope. But in terms of financing, yes, there are uh, global green bonds available, carbon credits available. But I've come to believe that when we speak about financing climate change initiatives, there are two ways to look at it. One is of course, incentives and support, financial support, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we're spending on compensation for erratic weather events or climate change effects. And the other is going beyond that when we look at this as a climate emergency, when we look at this as an imperative that we have to follow, uh, something we cannot really avoid. For example, electric mobility, for example, um, energy consumption, which is more efficient, for example, rainwater harvesting or afforestation. Going further, looking at the state of our world and our climate crisis, I think we have to think beyond just incentives, you know, because incentives is not, is something which is just giving it a push. This is going to be a daily requirement for us. And I think how we breathe, it is that that essential. You know, so somewhere we need to stop thinking about essential, uh, incentives. Somewhere we need to stop thinking about the support we give. And it is a necessity. We, you know, conduct our daily lives in a way that the luxury goods we buy off the hand without thinking of incentives. The normal uh, food that we buy is without incentives. This is something that is very similar to that. So incentives will remain for a short time incentives will remain for uh, you know a period that we can really survive and sustain this incentive period but going beyond that this is going to be a necessity so financially i think it's going to be wise to invest more in climate change without thinking of incentives because this is something for our own survival as you said time is of essence uh, for everyone actually not just for mumbai as a city as environment minister tell me what your top three priorities are over the next couple of years I think there is only one priority I have, uh, whatever we call as development, we need to add sustainable to it. And I'll give you a small example of uh, the year 2020 and the state of Maharashtra. Um, if you see, we've, we've uh, faced one of the biggest COVID crises in the world, and that is because we've been very, very transparent and accountable for every number of every COVID patient that we've counted. We've been the highest in terms of, uh, you know, the tests, we've been highest in number of rec uh, reporting the tests, and also a great recovery number. So we faced a COVID crisis like never before. We faced a crisis like never before. But all throughout that crisis, we've had three major functions that have been going on, apart from COVID. That was one of the biggest things we were managing. But we've had an industrial investment, right, from data centers to textiles to uh, automotive to almost anything you can speak of in three phases in Magnetic Maharashtra to the tune of 1,15,000 crores as MOUs. And more than 85% of those MOUs have been realized land has been allotted and the work has started so that was one why we did that the infrastructure work really did not stop so the coastal road is going on full scale the mumbai nagpur highway is being made pune ring road is being made a new airport at navi mumbai is being made gmlr um, you know whatever infrastructure work was going on be it dams be it roads be it uh, you know uh, ports nothing has stopped that has been going along the third most important thing which we're really proud of along with infrastructure and along with investment is environment. Last year, we declared RA as a forest of 329 hectares within our city. Uh, we've got 10 conservation reserves out of 15 declared in one shot. We declared our 50th sanctuary in Maharashtra. We've got marine biodiversity reserve. We've 
uh, really had meetings almost every month to attach more and more mangrove like areas and mangrove areas into official protection of the indian forest act then by june we'd have almost 10000 hectares of mangroves newly coming into the protection of the indian forest act 1927 so these three things can go in hand in hand they can go uh, in coexistence moving forward infrastructure investment industry and environment are not things to be looked at in different silos we can coexist looking at development which is sustainable i think sustainable development is what we need today in the world because uh, human life can go on but the quality of life really comes in with environment and that's very crucial mm. i am conscious that uh, you know i've taken up uh, my time in this conversation but i have one last question for you you know you're a young leader as well and uh, that gives you i suppose the courage to be more ambitious about your dreams as in terms of what you want to see for your city or your state tell me what you want the world to look at mumbai as when they think about environment and when they think about climate change and when they think as you said about sustainability what is the example that you want mumbai to put forth for the world to see you know if, uh, to be very honest it's it's that uh, basically Uh, just the other day when we started the heritage walk for the mumbai municipal corporation headquarters as a part of our tourism initiative uh, we discovered that there's a goddess on top of the building and below her is a motto saying herbs prima in indus and it was engraved out there about 120 years ago it's a latin uh, uh, thing that really calls the city of mumbai the first or the most important city in india and uh, financially it has been it has been in terms of the growth it has been in terms of the city of dreams because we have industry we have cricket we have bollywood we've got dreams really growing in mumbai and um, uh, looking at that i'd love to be having mumbai at the forefront of the climate change initiatives as a leader of climate change initiatives and sustainable development i'd love that personally but i think we've gone beyond that time that we see someone as a leader and we all try to follow it it's time for all of us collectively to be leaders in our own way and lead climate change initiatives and sustainable development at the same rate same pace which is hopefully fast enough and important enough uh, to go hand in hand together because i think the time for a singular leadership has gone away it's it's time that we collectively work on this so all of us can be really leaders and we can contribute a large part to that so i'm not going to be selfish for the city of mumbai i'm going to speak for the world and the human race on on, on this that's fantastic be an example in yourself right <laughs> thank exactly. you very much so appreciate your time and thoughts today and uh, just echoing your sentiments let's hope next year kalaba conversations happens in kalaba and we can really you know have this conversation on a much deeper level but appreciate your time and everything that you've had to add to today's chat thank you thank you bitali thank you